Good afternoon and welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 350 registered attendees for today's webinar. I want to remind you today's webinar is eligible for one continuing educa education hour. The post webinar survey and certificate process are automated, so the survey link will be included in the follow up email, which you will receive about an hour after this webinar has finished. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. Okay, let's kick off today's webinar by giving an OR Today Live surprise pack to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. April is National Pecan Month. Which state produces the most pecans? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I just want to remind everyone that if you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can watch them on our website, ortoday.com. Just click on the webinar tab and you can still receive a continuing education credit as well. Also, help us celebrate the year of the nurse by sharing a standout story about you or a nurse in your life. Each submission will be entered to win a $25 Bath and Body Works gift card. Visit ortoday.com forward slash contest to enter. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our OR Today surprise package is. And it is Christine Deboisic. Congratulations, Christine. Of course, the correct answer is Georgia. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Key Surgical. Key Surgical is a leading global provider of sterile processing, operating room, and endoscopic pro products that support processes and procedures in hospitals and surgical facilities throughout the US and internationally. For more information, visit keysurgical.com. Our presenter today is Michelle Lemons, Clinical Educator OR at Key Surgical. Michelle, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am Michelle Lemons, again, to repeat, clinical educator um, from Key Surgical. I first just wanted to say thank you and hello. I'm so happy to be here talking with you today and about this topic. I wanted to start by saying thank you for being here and taking, taking the time to listen in. I wanna start with just a quick introdu introduction, a little bit about who I am. First, I am a wife. Um, this is a picture of my husband and I when we first met and he still rocked his Fabio hair. This of course is why I married him. I thought, well, he would have beautiful children and I wasn't wrong. This is our oldest Jackson, who's three and our youngest Opal, who is one. A little bit more about me. I have been a nurse for seven years and have worked in almost every area of patient care, the operating room, acute care, post-acute care, and in nursing homes. Some of the people I love the most are nurses, including my husband, my brother-in-law, a few of my best friends, and one of my sisters who's pictured here when she pinned me at my nursing ceremony. This next picture is a picture of my Periop 101 graduating class after we took our final. And finally, my favorite picture of myself when I worked in the OR, pregnant as can be um, with my son, with our oldest, and sitting with an equally pregnant friend, resting my legs and basking in the sun. Rather than start this presentation with objectives, like most presentations, I would like to start with a preface. This is not a condescending, tell you what you already know presentation. I do not want to waste your time, make you feel bad, or tell you that every change in healthcare is up to you as an individual. Nothing could be further from the truth. This presentation was started after my husband called me in the middle of the night, he works night shifts, to talk during an emotionally challenging shift. The nurse he was taking over for had failed to update him on a patient condition, not out of malice, but because she had been overwhelmed during her shift. And he spent the rest of the night putting the pieces together to care safely for his patient, and he was struggling. They were short staffed, lacking basic supplies, and he was challenged mentally and emotionally. The next day, I got an article in my inbox titled, How to Make Your Nurses More Resilient and I immediately became disheartened and got mad about that title. 
Maybe it is just semantics, but it felt personal to ask a nurse to be more resilient. It sounded like a challenge, like, why don't you just power through it? So I started writing this presentation. Currently with COVID-19, it may seem like the worst time to talk about caregiver burnout, but I disagree. We have nowhere to go but up. And this pandemic is highlighting issues that have been affecting healthcare professionals and patients for over a decade. <laughs> Sun Tzu uh, put it this way, in the midst of chaos, there is an opportunity. I hope you glean at least one new thought or idea from this presentation. I hope you leave feeling empowered or at a minimum, you have a hot title to talk about on your break. You are doing incredible work every day and this presentation is intended to celebrate that and encourage those who care for others to also care for themselves. And now the objectives. This presentation will begin with details about current statistics and problems contributing to healthcare professional burnout. It may seem heavy and dark at the beginning, but it does get better. Next, we will discuss organizations that speak out about healthcare burnout, and we will conclude with tools that individuals, leaders, and organizations can apply to help themselves and their team. So what is going on? Well, there is significant research about the health status of nurses in the United States. This research is showing us that nurses have higher levels of stress, are overall less healthy than the average American, they get less sleep, they are more likely to be overweight, they double the national percentage of depression, and that burnout is twice as high in medicine than any other field. Burnout is a term that's used to describe a human response to chronic emotional and interpersonal stress at work. It's defined by exhaustion, cynicism, and inefficiency. And even after making adjustments for factors such as age, sex, level of education, and hours worked in the past week, this, this statistic is true, that burnout is twice as high in medicine than in any other field. <laughs> And it gets worse. Nurses are more likely to complete suicide than the general population. When this research flashed in my inbox, I was sad and even sadder because I wasn't surprised. This is not a new increase and this is not exclusive to nursing. In fact, physicians lead the healthcare pack in rates of suicide. Several years ago, Judy Davidson, who's a nurse, was struck with information that three nurses in her workplace had died of suicide. As a researcher, she looked for statistics and could only find that research was completed outside of the United States regarding nurse suicide. So she gathered a team and researched. They published their first data in 2018 and then they applied and received access to the national data set of suicides from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In June, 2019, they published the first national longitudinal study of US nurse suicides, and this is what they found. They found that female nurse suicides were significantly higher at about 12 per 100,000 than in the total population of females, which was about eight per 100,000. Similarly, male nurses were at almost 40 per 100,000 compared to the male population at 28. So nurses eat their young. Well, not literally. This is a pervasive phrase in healthcare regarding bullying. When nurses are told about this phenomenon in nursing school, it's often communicated as bullying from experienced nurses toward novice nurses. However, that is not completely true. Even though reports of bullying are higher for new nurses or novice nurses, all nurses, regardless of their years of experience, report bullying in the workplace. In a survey of nearly 200 new nurses, 72% reported experiencing bullying in the last month, and 21% of those reported that that bullying happened daily over a six month period. 
Recent estimates place the incidence of bullying targeting all nurses, regardless of years of experience, at about 30%. This is between nurses. These percentages do not include other healthcare professionals. Bullying doesn't include physicians or surgeons, and it does not include the current research that reveals a significant amount of violence that healthcare workers suffer from their patients or patient family members. According to American Nurses Association, lateral violence is so prevalent in the nursing community that it may be appropriate to call it an epidemic. You might be saying, Michelle, I don't get it. Bullying is for middle schoolers and high schoolers. What are you even talking about? Well, this bullying is part of a larger issue and that issue is workplace violence. There are five recognized categories of workplace violence. The first is a threat to professional status or public humiliation. This can be in front of patients, in front of family members, in front of colleagues, it can be any of those. The second is a threat to personal standing or name calling, insults, teasing, degrading comments. A third form of workplace violence is overworking or creating impossible deadlines. We hear this a lot when we listen to news about healthcare communicated as inadequate staffing, unsafe nurse patient ratios, extended hours, mandatory overtime. Some mandatory on-call shifts can last 48 to 72 hours. The fourth type is destabilization or failing to give credit where credit is due. And the fifth is isolation. This is not just not sitting by someone at lunch, but can even include withholding information regarding a patient's care or a patient's condition. So what about perioperative nurses? Do they experience workplace violence? Are they any happier or at least finding satisfaction in their jobs? Well, data from a total of a little over 1500 nurses revealed some good and some bad news. And here comes the age old question. Do you want the good news first or the bad news? Let's start with the good. The good news is that post-operative nurses that were surveyed were more satisfied with their work environments, including their coworkers and the culture within the post-anesthesia care unit or PACU. The bad news is that intraoperative nurses working in the OR are the least satisfied, noting the lowest satisfaction with coworkers, with their communication, and with the day-to-day -day work environment. In fact, a handful of research articles state, working in the operating room is significantly associated with higher scores of depression. Now think of the list we just discussed about workplace violence. Isolation. Imagine you're a new nurse, three months in and just south of orientation. You walk into the operating room mid case and the nurse you're taking over for won't even look you in the eye. She tells you, the patient's here for a transplant, obviously. No skin issues, he's doing fine. And then cheerily says goodbye to everyone else in the room, laughs at an inside joke, and then she leaves. How can you safely care for this patient? You don't know if they have metal implants. You don't know what's happened so far in the case. Have you sent any specimens that you're waiting for the results of? When's the last time she updated the family? Now let's think of a threat to personal standing. You're new to scrubbing in the OR. You're working with a circulator who you don't know well. The surgeon is well known for being rude and harsh to staff. He's rolling his eyes and throwing things on the mayo stand while you attempt to wipe Escar off the instrument quickly and get it back to him. Tears are welling up in your eyes and you hear the circulator sigh and say, scrubbing just isn't for some people. It's bullying all the way around. And it is so distracting from the care that you can provide your patient. These are real life everyday examples of bullying and incivility that lead to real life unsafe patient outcomes every year for over a decade. In fact, we have long strong evidence 
that supports it does affect patient care and it has been for over a decade. According to the Emergency Care Research and Institute, or ECRI, patient harm is the 14th leading cause of morbidity and mortality globally. Every year, ECRI publishes a list of the top 10 patient safety concerns. And every year, at least two of these can be directly tied to healthcare professional burnout, communication barriers, workplace violence, and bullying. I read back to at least 2010, and here are some of the leading patient concerns that they have identified. Unrecognized patient deterioration. Excuse me, there we go. Caregiver competency inadequacy, workplace safety and burnout, and diagnostic errors. Beyond the patient implications, this culture also creates major professional and financial repercussions for healthcare institutions. This incivility and burnout are associated with decreased quality of care and increased medical errors, decreased productivity and professional effort, decreased patient satisfaction, high turnover rates, and high turnover rates. As an example, the estimated cost of replacing a nurse is $27,000 to $103,000. And with physicians, the estimate is ranges from hundreds of thousands to more than a million dollars, depending on the physician's specialty, location, and the length of the vacancy. The American Psychological Association research shows that workplace stress is estimated to cost the U.S. economy more than $500 billion, and each year, 550 million workdays are lost due to stress on the job. So these repercussions lead not only to major patient care problems, but as shown, also major financial problems for institutions, and we create a loop that continues. Financial problems and high turnover rates equals short staffing and decreased promotional opportunities and the need to cut costs, which all leads to dissatisfaction, burnout, and bullying. In the wild, animals eat their young for a few reasons that scientists have been able to conclude. First is to attract a mate. There's good research out there about bullies. Often, people bully others to make people think they are strong, to get attention, or to get someone to like them, to get a reward. The second reason is to weed out weak or feeble offspring. Healthcare is a very challenging field. It takes a level of thick skin to be able to watch a patient die, to educate some, someone on a new overwhelming diagnosis that's going to change their everyday life, to help someone to the bathroom and completely enter their most intimate places and feelings. You have to have a level of strength or thick skin to be able to be successful as a healthcare provider. Third and finally, scientists know that in the most dire situations, animals eat their young because they are starving. While I think that all three of these are real life examples why bullying happens in the healthcare setting, I would venture to say that nurses and healthcare professionals eat their young because they are starving. Compiling many research studies on healthcare professional burnout and depression, these are the top 10 contributing factors that have been reported. Security risks, not feeling safe to perform their job. Staffing issues, not enough help when help is needed. Culture, an environment of practice that is more stressful and less supportive. Professionals often report intimidation being used as a tool to motivate them to do something. A lack of social support, not having safe, consistent support in the workplace. Caring for seriously ill patients. Mentally and emotionally, this takes a toll. Combined with a lack of social support, this is a detriment. Role ambiguity, a lack of clarity or uncertainty related to your position or role. 
exposure to infectious disease. This is multifaceted in its effect on staff as we are seeing and experiencing right now in the face of COVID-19. A feeling of fear mixed with compassion, a calling to serve but also be protected, and a face-to-face -face recognition of your own mortality and feelings of powerlessness. Exposure to work-related violence. The American Journal of Managed Care reports that 75% of all reported workplace assaults happen in a healthcare setting. Exclusion from the decision-making process. This is a major factor in feelings of powerlessness. Not being included in the conversation and having expectations and roles changed without a seat at the table. Inadequate supplies to perform their job safely. We would not send a builder to a site without a hard hat, and we would not send an electrician to a house without a voltage tester to see if they get shocked. Not giving healthcare professionals adequate supplies is the same as these examples. And all of these factors contribute to healthcare professional burnout and to bullying. This data is nothing new in the workplace, but it is magnified during these times. COVID-19 is highlighting this information. Hospital policies that confuse or contradict globally accepted medical standards. Intimidation of healthcare professionals that speak out or take measures to protect themselves in the workplace. PPE changes and lack of amounts of adequate PPE are making national headlines. Nurses are posting images of themselves wearing garbage bags as gowns having to care for acutely ill patients with inadequate supplies, and overall being left out of communications with those who are their leaders. Maureen Dugan put it this way. She said, hospitals are leaving us out of the communication and planning around the care of these patients. Even with shortages of adequate PPE and medical supplies, healthcare professionals deserve the respect of an honest conversation, a transparent conversation. So what do the leaders say? Many regulatory bodies and groups are addressing these issues of burnout and bullying. One article referenced that over a hundred groups have formed to fight this crisis and they all call us to action. The Joint Commission states that organizations that fail to address workplace violence through formal systems are indirectly promoting it. The National Academy of Medicine's Action Collaborative on Clinician Wellbeing and Resilience states that the high prevalence of burnout among healthcare professionals is cause for concern because it appears to be affecting quality and the safety of the healthcare system performance. Efforts are needed to address this growing problem. Harvard Business Review a Harvard Business Review article that was shared by AORN states that evidence is mounting that applying personal band-aid solutions to an epic and rapidly evolving workplace phenomenon may be harming and not helping the battle. With burnout now officially recognized by the World Health Organization, the responsibility for managing, for managing it has shifted away from the individual and toward the organization. Leaders take note. It is now on you to build a burnout strategy. According to the foremost expert on burnout, Christina Moslock, social psychologist and professor emerita of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, if we place the responsibility on individual nurses to overcome these challenges, then we are attacking the issue from the wrong angle. This is the analogy that she used. Picture a canary in a coal mine. They are healthy birds singing away as they make their way into the cave. But when they come out full of soot and disease, they are no longer singing. Can you imagine us asking why the canaries made themselves sick? No, because the answer would be obvious. The coal mine is making the birds sick. It's an organizational problem. It's a leadership problem and it's an individual problem. We would not tell these birds to be more resilient. We would listen to them. 
We all lose with this culture, but we all win if we can fix it. And now is the time to fix it. So what do we say? How do we respond to all of this? Dr. Carolyn Elton, a vocational psychologist and author who specializes in helping doctors, states that leaders should ditch the R word, resilient, because it suggests that individuals should be able to avoid or recover from burnout on their own. Instead, we should praise all of our healthcare professionals and say, you are resilient. Merriam-Webster defines resilience as the capability of a strained body to recover its size and shape after deformation, caused especially by compressive stress. Healthcare workers do not need to become more resilient. They already are resilient. Day after day, they show up, they continue to provide superior care for their patients, they continue their education, and they love what they do because they have pride in caring for each of us. They need resources and leaders to step up so that they can be heard. COVID-19 is opening up a great opportunity for us to unite healthcare and change it for the better. Let's discuss what you can do, what leaders can do, and what steps organizations can take to help create solutions. If at this moment you are saying to yourself, this doesn't happen in my department, we have a great team. I implore you to watch for one day. Look for this, ask your teammates, and I can guarantee you it is happening in some form. If it isn't, call or email me so we can come and study you. Now I'd like you to pause and think of when you first started your most recent job not being able to find equipment, not knowing the unspoken rules of the department, and not knowing who you could trust for reliable information. Tap into that and remember what that feels like. Maybe you were overwhelmed. Maybe you are a super confident person and you've never felt these things. Think about a friend of yours who isn't as confident as you. I'm not placing the responsibility on the shoulders of individual nurses by saying these steps that you can take as an individual, but I do think it's important to remember that we each have a role to play in this and an individual does have a responsibility to themselves and to their team to participate in changing the culture. <laughs> the first step as an individual is keep me safe. Keep yourself safe. Keep your colleagues safe, and you will keep your patients safe. Nurses are advocates. It's in our blood. And it's vital to advocate for yourself and your team members. What is your specific gifting? Not everyone is good at the same things, but we're all good at something. We need the outspoken nurses to speak out, the gifted writers to write, the readers to read and each person to use their gifting to advocate for nursing and all healthcare professionals. Embrace what you bring to the table and share it. The second is value me. Pause and give yourself and your team gratitude. Be the person you needed when you were new. If you see someone doing something valuable, tell them. There's great research that supports starting and ending a shift by making a gratitude list. Three things you're, you're grateful for. One of my coworkers has a strong passion for meditation. So she starts her shift with a quick five minute guided meditation and offers to include anyone who wants to try it with her. Praying, meditating, pausing for gratitude, controlled breathing exercises, all of these can help ease the tensions of a shift and be done in five minutes or less. The third is make it easy. Use your reps and companies that supply you with devices, goods, or materials. They are experts and should be available to be your user guide. Use your resources around you and take some of the burden off your own plate. The next is leadership. Leaders, much of the culture and responsibility to ensure safe and satisfied staff is on your shoulders. You are in this position for a reason and you have a great opportunity to make a difference. 
first involve your team. It sounds deceivingly simple, but asking your team instead of telling your team what they need can be highly successful. One of the greatest strengths of a leader is knowing their team. Who's the unofficial leader on your team? Who do people seek out for answers? Who's the listener or the motivator? Ask for input, pay attention, and foster that social support. Value those people in those roles and encourage them to unite and support each other. Practice meaningful recognition and celebrate your team in sincere, purposeful ways along the way. Second, pick a plan. The best way to attack burnout, bullying, and violence, and depression at your facility is to pick a plan and stick with it. Research supports a formal education program is a top way to empower your team to empower nurses. A great example is AORN. They have resources, ways to get involved, and tools to measure, implement, and evaluate the effectiveness of a plan. Use your associations. There's no need to reinvent the wheel and no need to do it all by yourself. All of the regulatory bodies listed above have plans and resources for free on how to both measure and manage healthcare workers, burdens, and stressors. Third, a common phrase in healthcare is if it isn't charted, it didn't happen. We champion evaluation. The nursing process, assess, plan, implement, and evaluate should be applied here. Assess the problem and what is contributing to it at your site. Plan interventions, implement them, and evaluate what works and what doesn't, and then start again. This doesn't mean assign the job to someone else. You are the leader and your team needs you to lead. Fourth, use your reps. Often reps are overlooked. You don't have to know everything. Reps from all of the companies that supply you with devices and equipment should be experts in their field and with their products. Take the burden off of you by using these resources. Call them. Ask them to provide education around best practice or how to use their devices and let them be the experts. Um, Dr. Anna McGee, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at the Joint Commission, Questions organizations in this way. Do trustees view harm as part of the cost of doing business or rather as totally unacceptable and they're committed to its elimination? So two healthcare organizations. First, assess your view of harm and shift it as needed. If it's being viewed as the cost of doing business, or being viewed as something that needs to be completely eliminated. However, it is viewed will be the reality at your facility. This shift in thinking about harm is the transformational change that leaders of commercial airlines in the nuclear power industry and other highly reliable industries embraced that helped ensure the viability of their businesses. Burnt out employees cost money and burnt out employees lose money. Turnover, training, time off, decreased ability to perform their job function efficiently. It's vital to assess your view of harm and change it. Second is ask the question, what do you need? Again, deceivingly simple, but significantly powerful. Ask your team what they need and listen. What do they need to create positive work environments? What tasks are healthcare providers performing that are not contributing to patient care? How can you improve the usability and relevance of health information technology? Have executive leadership roles that are dedicated to clinician well being and assess how business and management decisions, such as implementing new technologies, affect job demands and levels of burnout. Some clinician burnout is related to laws, regulations, and policies that contribute little or no value to patient care. And as you're able, those should be eliminated. Third is reduce stigma and improve burnout recovery services. Many healthcare professionals do not report burnout. 
organizations should facilitate access to employee assistance programs, peer support programs, and mental health providers without the information being admissible in malpractice litigation. Fourth is participate in research. Healthcare organizations in conjunction with federal agencies should develop a coordinated research agenda on healthcare burnout. According to the National Academy of Medicine, the research should focus on the drivers of burnout across career paths and life stages for different types of clinicians, implications for workers and patients, and come up with potential systems level interventions to improve clinician and learner well being. I still remember my first nurse victory. A patient at the nursing home had refused to shower for months, literally months. He had advanced dementia and would physically lash out at every attempt to help him into the shower. One day, an old Johnny Cash song came on on the radio and he began to sing along. I had a light bulb moment. I sang Johnny Cash's Jackson while I walked him into the bathroom and helped him into the shower. As long as I sang, he showered. It was a very moving experience, the key to his success. Every healthcare professional that works in patient care has a story like this. The unique, lovable key about a patient. I hope that as long as we implement these tools, we can learn to foster this curiosity and care for one another as healthcare professionals. As 2020 is the year of the nurse celebrating Florence Nightingale, she put it this way, the world is put back by the death of everyone who has to sacrifice the development of his or her peculiar gifts to conventionality. Use your peculiar gifts to support and encourage your team. For the 17th year in a row, nursing has been voted the most trusted profession. Let's make 2020 the year of the nurse and midwife be a year of great change and increased job satisfaction and mostly safety for our healthcare professionals. Call your reps and use your resources. Work together and be kind. You are resilient and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Michelle, um, for that very, very interesting presentation. We have a couple of questions um, for you. Uh, what could a facility do right now to help their nurses avoid burnout during this crisis? Yeah, I think uh, primarily would be having transparent conversations, consistent messages, and for their leaders to be present and available and use the resources that are out there for them. Okay, dokie. Um, I've had a couple of attendees asking, is there a way to get in touch with you about this and other educational opportunities? Yeah, actually on this page, the best way is to email education at keysurgical.com. Another way we always have humans that answer our phone here. So if you call here, they'll be able to give you my contact information or directly direct you to my line. Okay, so um, following on from that, can they contact you uh, for copies of, of the presentation to show their leadership teams? Sure. Yep, absolutely. I, I believe that OR Today does publish these on their website after the presentation, but yes. also, okay, thank you. <laughs> you can also email um, education at keysurgical.com and we should be able to send you a PDF or a PowerPoint of the presentation as well. That's great. Yes. And just to follow on from that, yes. This, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, ortoday.com, within the next 24 hours. So if you wish to have another look back at Michelle's comments, uh, feel free. Um, 
following on, we have another question. How do you see the PPE shortage to nurses? How, how do I see it? Yeah. Um, I think it, I think the problem is is more of a conversation problem and less of a PPE problem. The thing that I'm hearing across the board is just wanting to have that conversation with transparency, which I think is what is what is missing in a lot of the conversations that we're having about PPE. Where is it? Where to go? What happened? Did we know? Those those types of conversations that we just need to foster among our leadership teams and with one another. Okay, and another question here is, how do we utilize reps at this time we are, when we are limiting access to facilities? Yeah, a lot of a lot of reps are experts in their field. So if it, they're from the operating room, if they're from endoscopy, if they're from sterile processing, they are experts in that area. They can provide education, educational resources, virtual in-services, and just email and phone calls. A lot of people that are working on the floor don't have time to go and dive deep into education or find specific resources. They need to be able to call someone and say, hey, this is what I need, and let somebody else do that legwork for them. Okay, that's great. So they, uh, phone or email will be available for that. Okay, that is great. Um, just seeing if we've got any more questions. No, we don't appear to have any more. Um, and just as a reminder of the final screen, you can see how to get in contact with Michelle. So we will wrap up now so you can all get back to your daily activities. So thank you, Michelle, for a really informative and thought provoking webinar. And thank you again to our sponsor, Key Surgical. Uh, just a reminder that the post webinar survey and certificate process is automated service survey link will be included in the follow-up email which you'll receive in about an hour's time once you've completed the survey you'll be able to download your certificate immediately if you have any questions uh, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com and for more information on all our upcoming or today webinars please visit our website ortoday.com thank you once again for joining us uh, stay safe and we hope to see you next time